Well, it may not seem very much like winter in the last couple of days with 50 some de degrees, but um, hopefully I'll inspire you to garden in this season as well. And actually in 2017, Timber Press uh, called me up out of the blue and asked me to write a book on the winter garden. So it, it, it took me um, longer than, luckily a very patient editor longer uh, than originally planned since I only have time to write in, in the winter time, but I uh, got all the manuscript and over a thousand annotated photographs uh, to Timber Press last February. And, and I just talked to my, my editor this a uh, couple of weeks ago. She said she's getting uh, proofs together by, by the end of the month. Um, so it all takes a long time. So maybe by next year, there'll, there'll be a book uh, celebrating the, on the Winter Garden as well. And so uh, winter is the season of long shadows. It's a season that we really need to be in tune with looking at ephemeral uh, images in the garden that may not last very long, but we, we go out and, and uh, are just in, totally engaged in the early morning when we have shadows on, on the snow. And of course, the snow itself is ephemeral as well. And we don't always have snow in southern New England, but we're anticipating that we may be uh, buried shortly. Who knows? Um, and there are other uh, beauties in the winter garden, hoarfrost, uh, these uh, spicy icicles that fringe the leaves and the structures outside. And again, it's the early morning hours when you're walking outside to enjoy your garden that you can appreciate uh, all this beauty. Frost on uh, the, the fruit of sumac and even on, on late blooming asters and flowers. So I'm going to define the winter season. So this is November and um, there, there are different um, definitions to when winter begins, because we I all probably like you learned that winter began, began with the uh, solstice on, on December 21st. But our weather people that talk on uh, uh, our media have their own version. They call it meteorological winter. They, they think winter begins on December 1st. Uh, but horticultural winter actually begins in no, in November, especially in New England, uh, in this region, it begins with a hard killing frost. And so if you think about November through uh, April, and we've even had snow in May, we have five months of more of winter. And we better uh, uh, be able to celebrate that uh, in our gardening. It's nothing to be depressed about thinking about five months of winter. And of course, there are winter flowers. And the first uh, win winter blooms are our native witch hazels, which actually start blooming in November. In fact, witch hazels bookend uh, the winter season, the native Hamamelis virginiana blooming in November, and the Asian witch hazels uh, ending their bloom in March. So perhaps you have a bottle of this astringent in your medicine cabinet. There's still a cottage industry in Eastern Connecticut that actually cuts the brush of witch hazel and distills it. Uh, if you're out walking in an oak woods in November and look up at yellow flowers blooming without any leaves, that's our native witch hazel, Hamamelis virginiana. Uh, here it is in a garden. This is in November and we've got these bright flowers and uh, Asters are still hanging on with a few late blooms, and we've got other structures in the garden that give interest in the winter landscape. That's uh, Japanese bush clover, Lespedeza, that uh, holds the frost. So witch hazels are propagated by grafting, which is a more expensive and time-consuming way instead of starting plants from seed or from cuttings. And this is a plant that I uh, selected uh, driving along Route 146, you know, the highway that goes from Providence, Rhode Island to Worcester, Massachusetts. And perhaps you're like I am when you're, you're driving along the highway, you're botanizing as well. And you notice something that is in bright bloom on the side of the road and have to pull over and check it out. Well, this witch hazel has quite large flowers. So there are not uh, many uh, named varieties of our native witch hazel, but we call that wicked because it's wicked good. This is one called Harvest Moon that was introduced by Dick Jane's at Broken Arrow Nursery in Connecticut uh, that also has large blooms blooming in November and December. 
So our native witch hazel is a large shrub that will grow in partial shade as well as in full sun. It'll get to be 12 or 15 feet tall, can be grown as a multi-stem uh, shrub or even a, a tree form as well. And the, the pollinators that come out on warm days in November and even in December appreciate having a, a source for nectar and, and pollen. So having witch hazels to extend our bloom in our garden is so valuable to all other aspects of, that we appreciate in our gardens, the, the pollinators. What month is it? So this is the entrance of Swan Point Cemetery, historic garden cemetery in Providence, Rhode Island on Blackstone Boulevard. This is winter. These are autumn blooming cherries, Prunus subortella autumnalis. And this is a tree that we've used in our in gardening for, for years. And uh, this, however, climate change, we've seen actually a more floriferous bloom uh, in late fall and winter. And over the years, including this last year, I've photographed uh, this autumn cherry blooming in December and, and uh, November and in January. And amazingly enough, there are still flower buds left over at blooms a second time in April. So it's a great small tree to add to your landscape to celebrate the winter season, uh, perhaps with some ephemeral blooms, uh, and then the spring season as well. A couple of years ago. So thinking about designing your garden for the winter season, thinking about snow, and when we do have snow, it obliterates the ground, it really changes the landscape and having um, elements in the garden that will be above the snow line is important. So containers that are raised above the snow line, um, these are all hardy plants that you can grow in containers. Their roots are hardy, the cold winter temperatures, the pines and also uh, many conifers like yews are also perfectly hardy. So here we have a garden and when it's covered with snow, we lose that a uh, pattern that's on the ground plane. So it's important to have structure that's above the snow line as well. So the snow completely changes the landscape. It makes it magical. It, I still get up when we have, you know, even a dusting of snow a week ago and it was just barely covering the ground. You know, you wanna get up and see it covering the grass because it changes the landscape into a surreal landscape. It covers things, it covers blemishes, but while it covers, it also uh, shows off other forms in the landscape, celebrating structure, the structure of trees and the structure of frames and forms that we've designed in the garden. So here we have uh, a garden. We can't see the pathway anymore, but this frame, which is set perpendicular to the house, like the extension of a New England farmhouse with its L, and we've extended that into the garden as well with vertical forms that highlight uh, the garden, deciduous trees, the columnar beach, as well as the vertical forms of uh, Alaskan weeping cedar, Camacypris nutcapensis, green arrow, and the paperbark maple, Asa grisium with its exfoliating bark. So conifers are perhaps a a way to think about designing a winter garden. Of course, the entrance of um, we the library and the town hall has this wonderful planting of dwarf blue spruce um, at the entrance. It's really interesting. This is a, a photograph at the Arnold Arboretum with a collection of uh, Picea pungens uh, glauca, the Colorado blue spruce that was first brought east uh, over 100 years ago. And perhaps uh, you've learned, like, like I did in thinking of color theory, that the color blue is uh, cool and it recedes in the landscape. You'd use it as a shadow form. But in the winter, everything is changed. It's turned on its head because the color of the landscape and the light, the winter sun uh, changes blue to warm colors. So silvery blue, instead of being uh, cold actually, comes at you and, and is warm and it really changes the landscape. Of course, there are many different conifers you are familiar with, many of them that you might be using for decorating um, in, in December, the golden forms of camisipris and the blue forms of uh, Alaskan cedar, uh, red fruit on crab apples. Oh, there are many uh, different beautiful forms and colors that we can add to our garden in the winter landscape. And of course, conifers have evolved with 
narrow needles, their leaves have evolved to survive this brutal season um, to prevent evaporation and water loss through their leaves. This is one of my favorite scenes in Acadia National Park at Skudak Peninsula. And we have these beautiful jack pines in this um, pool of frozen water within the ledge. And this you know, may be an abstraction perhaps of a Japanese garden and it's beautiful, but it's a brutal landscape with scarcely any soil for plants to grow uh, on this frozen ledge. So Pinus banksiana, jack pine, there's a dwarf form that's called Scudic that was named by Al Fordham, who collected it. Al Fordham was the former propagator of the Arnold Arboretum in Boston. So here we have this wonderful mound form uh, growing on ledge. And conifers in a familiar setting in a garden, this is a Japanese stroll garden in Northeast Harbor, Maine, the Astaku Azalea Garden uh, in the winter landscape. So having evergreen conifers are valuable in giving us bones that frame our winter garden. But also deciduous trees are beautiful, especially trees that have different branching habits, perhaps upright or, or weeping. And here's a 150 year old copse of weeping beech. This is at the Honeywell Estate in Wellesley, Massachusetts. It was planted in 1856. Uh, it was actually planted before the, the mansion house was built. Originally, this, uh, there was a center tree uh, in this uh, planting and the edges of the weeping branches rooted in and created the circle of cops and that original tree in the middle has died, but it's created this wonderful cathedral-like pattern, uh, which is just amazing to come into in the winter landscape with these twisted trunks, these elephantine gray bark. And you could add that into your garden and perhaps if you've got enough space or uh, on a much smaller scale, here's a bosque or a copse of crab apples, a circle of crab apples. This is sugar time, which is a very disease resistant variety. So this is a garden that we planted in North Grafton, Massachusetts. It's been on many garden conservancy tours. We planted this in 1998. And so here are the winter fruit, which are very persistent, hanging on with red berries frozen with ice. And they're small enough that they don't form a, a litter problem in the garden. They actually dry like raisins. And you can even see their remnant fruit uh, the following May when the flowers are blooming. So this is sugar time crab apple with fragrant flowers in May. A circular boss, this is 18 feet in diameter. So here it is. The first spring, we planted this in 1998. These are small trees. Um, so this is the first year that was blooming. And after several years, we've established guide wires across the uh, crown of the trees to train the branches. And eventually we created this wonderful canopy that didn't need to be supported by wires anymore that forms this bosque, this shady bosque in this sunny border. And it's pruned once a year and pruned in the summertime. It's pruned in August or if August is too hot, it might be the first of September. So unlike orchard pruning, which you might think of pruning apple trees in the wintertime for fruit production, we want to prune this in the summertime. If you prune the trees in the spring, uh, at every cut, you're going to have new growth, vigorous new growth established, and we want to prune off that to maintain this horizontal form. So prune ornamental crab apples in the summertime. A wonderful shady spot. So this is um, October and winter. Uh, by, by, by appointment with a group. So like I said, it's been on tour for the Garden Conservancy in, in the past, and uh, it will be featured in a, an article in Fine Gardening Magazine within the next month. So here's another garden that has um, forms that show above the uh, snow line. These parallel hedges of, of boxwood. And perhaps you're familiar with thinking about boxwood hedges in parterres and herb gardens where they form the perimeter of the garden. And here they're in more of an abstract line. So here's a before photograph of the space. It's a corner entry. This is the way to the kitchen door between the house and the L. And so we established a, a field stone ellipse with its axis on that door. You can see the 
curved path. Originally, there was no path. And so here we have curves and the ellipse. And so it really changes the space. And then to give contrast, we have hedges that are perpendicular to the house and parallel to each other, which uh, re both repeat the lines, the architectural lines of the house, but contrast with the curves. This is Newport Blue, and this, these have been, um, this was planted in 1995. So uh, 28 some years old, going on 30 years old. They're pruned once a year. They're maintained at 30 inches high. Now Newport blue boxwood can easily get over six feet tall. So it really changes the space since we have the, the uh, vertical gable end of the house being dominant and the corner is actually the focal point, the intersecting line. So we've moved that over by establishing strong patterns on the ground plane. In March, which is essentially the same as winter. And it's planted with herbs because you can plant gardens with all different kinds of uh, herbaceous perennials and annuals. And these are um, both perennial and annual uh, flowering herbs. Calendulas and nasturtiums add to the color in the summer garden. Russian sage. Thyme, thyme. This is all planted with different varieties of thyme. Crocosmias in August, daylilies, echinaceas. No, no. Shirley's garden has, sorry, the herb garden. Yep. So we have parallel hedges of boxwood. And zigzag hedges, again, adding structure in your garden. It doesn't have to be formal, but uh, certainly having evergreen forms and uh, colorful bark on stewardia shows off in the winter landscape as well. There are forms of boxwood that naturally grow narrow and tall. They may need to be nipped just to keep them from uh, splaying open or uh, cinching them with a piece of sizo rope just to prevent ice damage in the wintertime. So this is Graham Blandy, which is a very fastidious narrow form of boxwood. And here we have a series of them uh, cr actually creating a horizontal line out of verticals. This is making a new garden in Peacedale, Rhode Island, uh, in 2012. In 2012, you may remember, we had no winter. In February, there's no frost in the ground now. Uh, there's no frost in the ground now as well. And in March, we were uh, uh, digging and, and building walls and, and making gardens. I don't know if 2023 is going to be like 2012. And so this is an acre uh, piece of property. Um, and uh, my, my client uh, purchased it uh, with a covenant that she was going to make a garden. She purchased it from her neighbor and didn't want to see any encroaching houses. So the, the covenant on the land is that uh, no, nothing can be built on it uh, and just a garden. Presumably that reduced the, the price somewhat. And so we're rebuilding a existing stone wall into these uh, zigzag bastions, which add eight different corners to every single segment, creating vertical lines. And then we're accentuating those vertical lines with uh, repeating them with a vertical form of Grand Blandy boxwood, as well as a DeGroote Spire arborvitae, and adding a horizontal line of dwarf crab apples, which repeats the horizontal line of the wall. So it's the entrance to this garden, which really uh, sets it off. So this is also planted with Quite a few deer-proof shrubs. We gave up on the, the bottom six feet of the arborvitaes years ago and let the deer browse them, but they grow tall. But bottle brush buckeye, Espulus pavaflora, is deer-proof as well as other plants. So here it is in the winter landscape. This is Tina, which is a dwarf form of Sargenti crab apples, and these are top grafted on a straight stem. They do need pruning preferably annually, just to keep them in, in good form without a lot of suckering. So here's a before photograph of what the one acre site looked like before I noticed that spruce tree in the background. And um, we've put in bamboo posts and defined the space. And we're using vertical forms to change the space. We also don't want to plant large trees that will eat the sky, that will dominate the sky. So the vertical forms, even as they grow taller, maintain their separation and give depth to the space. The foreground is planted with uh, Little King 
uh, birch, a uh, river birch. So little king, um, Betula nigra, little king, uh, gets to be about 25 or 30 feet tall. Betula nigra heritage, which you'll see in a minute, can get to be a 50 or 60 foot tall tree, which is a large tree. Uh, so here we have the bark, exfoliating bark in the winter landscape. They're underplanted with boxwood. This is Bet uh, Buxus sempervirens Vardar Valley, um, which is uh, also deer proof, growing in dry shade. Of course, here are the wonderful white bark of, of our native paper birch or canoe birch. Um, which people want to see in their gardens. But this is a Northern New England tree. This is photographed in Maine, uh, where uh, there are still cooler temperatures. It's not happy in hot, dry conditions. Betula nigra is much more heat tolerant. Of course, this is perhaps the most iconic image of a grove of paper birches in a garden. The, the famous blue steps in Namkeg, a garden designed by Fletcher Steel for Mabel Choate. It's owned by the trustees of reservations in Stockbridge and it's open to the public. This was recently restored with a new planting of paper birch. This is a paper birch that's at Tranquil Lake Nursery. I planted in 1988. We have a sandy soil, but this is within proximity to a kettle hole pond. So perhaps the roots are getting quite deep, but uh, paper birch does suffer from extreme heat, and we'll see that more with climate change. So it's, uh, as I said, a northern New England tree, and when it's uh, drought stressed or heat stressed, it's, it's not going to be as happy in the landscape. So here we have both river birch and paper birch. River birch, as young trees, the bark is quite white, but as it ages, it gets rougher and darkens. This is gray birch, which is also native, and uh, at Years ago, at least when I was learning horticulture, it was not thought of to be a, a valuable uh, ornamental tree in the garden because it was short-lived. Well, what, what's short-lived? But paper birch, or, excuse me, gray birch, of course, special popular foliar, foliar, is native. We see it growing out of rock cliffs um, uh, as on walls along uh, the highway. And here it is planted in New York City, in the High Line. So this is also a more diminutive tree, not getting as large as paper birch or uh, river birch, uh, perhaps only getting to be 25 feet tall with white bark. And it uh, suckers and can uh, increase. Um, even if an old stem dies out or you cut it down, you'll have a new sprout coming up. So here's the high line. This happens to be in September, but I can appreciate that it would be beautiful in the winter landscape as well. Closer uh, to here, this is in Boston, that the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. And this is the Monk's Garden, uh, named uh, as a surname is why it's called the Monk's Garden, a relative of Isabella Stewart Gardner. This is a garden designed by Michael Van Volkenberg, uh, planted with uh, beautiful trees that have uh, qualities of exfoliating and colored bark in the winter landscape. So here we have paper bark, maple, Asa grisium, stewartias, and gray birch, Betula populifolia, which again is not as large. And we have this grove of trees with this serpentine um, convoluted uh, walkway weaving between it uh, with evergreen hellebores and ferns in the winter landscape. This was in December several years ago, and we see the evergreen uh, fronds of evergreen wood fern, dryopteris, as well as hellebores uh, blooming in December. And of course, a view out the window and thinking of views out windows is something that uh, is also valuable uh, in designing gardens for all seasons of the year, but especially in the wintertime when it's cold. And if you cite a paper bark maple in a Western location, so you have the low rays of the late afternoon sun uh, shining through this exfoliating bark. It really accentuates the quality of the tree. Asa grisium, especially combining with other dark foliage evergreens like yews. This is uh, Taxus baccata repandens. This is actually at John Gwynne's Saconic Garden in Little Compton, Rhode Island. 
Asa Grisium in a garden I designed in Paxton, Massachusetts, north of Worcester, and combining it with the uh, coppery marcescent foliage of uh, Asian spice bush, Lindera angustifolia, which we'll talk more about. Stewartias. Stewartias are um, known for their beautiful single camellia like flowers that bloom in July, but beauty all year round is found in their. Uh, sinuous and exfoliating bark in shades of uh, tan and uh, cinnamon colored. And these are planted, as you can see, quite close to a house outside of a window in the winter landscape. The Poly Hill Arboretum on Martha's Vineyard contains a huge collection of uh, Stewartias uh, worth the trip. And if you go and visit the Poly Hill Arboretum in February and March, you won't be dealing with the crowds that are trying to get reservations to Martha's Vineyard in July and August. So as gardeners, you should visit now. There's also a beautiful collection of witch hazels. Red colored bark on Japanese maple, Asa pomatum. This is Sangu Kaku, the coral bark Japanese maple. And it's also a diminutive tree that doesn't get to be much more than 25 feet tall green foliage. This is a red twigged form of our native moosewood or paper bark maple, Asa pensavanicum. This is erythrocladum with uh, stripes of white and green and red bark. Cusa dogwoods, Cornus cusa. Some varieties have quite beautiful exfoliating bark as well. It shows up in the winter landscape, especially when underplanted with hellebore foliage. So this is um, in Ellsworth, Maine. I grew up in, in, in Maine and the, the landscapes along the coast are, are dear to me. This is a blueberry barren of low bush blueberries, Vaccinium angustifolium, which are tough and drought taunt. So these are those flavorful small berries that you make pies out of as opposed to tall high bush blueberries. And of course, high bush blueberries um, are beautiful, but they are, need moisture. They're gonna resent drought where the low bush blueberry is actually drought tolerant. And you can see this whole mix of different colors of twigs, this rex of, of uh, diversity found in the genetics from green to pink to red. So it's a valuable uh, small shrub to use as a ground cover in an ornamental landscape. And of course you can pick the berries in the summertime and have beautiful flowers, but the winter twigs are also beautiful. Here they are combined with a low growing juniper, quite red. Covered with ice. This is a garden north of Worcester in Holden, Massachusetts. And here are the red twig, um, red twigs of low bush blueberry, uh, vying for as much provenance as the red twig dogwoods. So this is Cornus sanguinea midwinter fire. At Tower Hill Botanic Garden or New England Botanic Garden in Boylston, Massachusetts, uh, a planting uh, the stems really are um, show off with yellow as well as red uh, colorations. However, the shrubby dogwoods need maintenance. They also require moisture. They resent drought. In fact, the dry sandy soils that we have at Tranquil Lake Nursery, they don't thrive. So you need to have moisture retentive soils. And they also need to have pruning to promote the new growth, which is most highly colored. So this is a yellow form of uh, shrubby dogwood. Flavoramia with uh, lemon yellow twigs. Weston Burt is perhaps the most crimson red. So here's pruning uh, dogwoods. That even now, uh, you know, sometime in uh, warm weather, you need to do some guard maintenance, get out, and, and you've, you've appreciated the red twigs, but they do need to be pruned back. Uh, before March. So this is at NYBG New York Botanic Garden, and they're doing winter pruning. They've got a lot of work to do. So they go around and they uh, cut down the shrubby dogwoods practically to the ground. And again, to regenerate new growth that's highly colored, you have to have water and moisture retentive soil. If you have a drought after pruning back hard, it's not going to work. So we make sure that if you plant the shrubby dogwoods, uh, of course, unpruned, they can get to be 15 to 20 feet tall. And really what you're looking for is something that uh, perhaps five to eight feet tall with highly colored stems. And you'll get that from 
annual pruning back hard to the ground. And of course, you recognize our winter friends, the robins gobbling up all the, the berries, uh, our winter berry hollies. We need to feed the birds as well. And so some years they may last through uh, February, and some years they're uh, stripped off by, by hungry birds. This is a, a beautiful entry. Uh, just one big winterberry holly, Ilex verticillata, in front of a yew uh, gracing the entrance to a house. A dwarf form of winterberry holly. This is red sprite, which doesn't get any higher than about three feet, as opposed to um, eight to 10, even taller for the species. And there are different color forms uh, from red ranging to orange. This is at an entry garden in Woodstock, Connecticut. There are yellow fruited winterberry hollies. Uh, Chrysocarpa was actually collected in New Bedford, Massachusetts around 1900. So that was a locally found yellow fruited form of our native winterberry holly. And of course, Ilex opaca, our native evergreen holly also has a gold fruited form as well. Orantiaca has orange fruits. And of course, this is American holly, um, a tree that has really benefited from, from climate change. So 30 some years ago, you might not grow uh, Ilex opaca north of Worcester, Massachusetts. It's always been a, a native coastal tree along New England uh, in Massachusetts and, and Rhode Island. But it's certainly, uh, I've noticed in the last 30 some years, it is uh, really thriving and it gets to be a large tree. Other winter fruit are aronia. So those are the uh, red fruits of that bosk of crab apples in the background. Red chokeberry is a native shrub that if you're out botanizing would be growing in a wet meadow, but it's actually very drought tolerant and it'll grow in dry full sun conditions. The fruit is persistent all winter long and it's not stripped off by birds like Ilex salata is. It also has red fall uh, foliage color. So here's Aronia red chokeberry in the gardens at Tranquil Lake Nursery. It's an uh, upright shrub and you can grow other perennials around its base as well. There's a black fruited form of Aronia, um, Aronia melanocarpa with jet black fruit. Now this is edible. The, the red berries are, um, they're not poisonous, but they're not very flavorful. But if you really want a lot of antioxidants, uh, more so than cranberries and blueberries, uh, black chokeberry, and you can find Aronia juice in uh, Whole Foods uh, supermarkets or health food stores. Uh, this is Viking, which was selected in Canada for fruit production. Uh, like the other chokeberries, attractive white flowers in May, a member of the rose family. Here we have black fruit and red fruit combined. So uh, they'll grow in full sun or partial shade, and it's an upright shrub that can get to be uh, six to eight feet tall. I love bayberry, uh, the fragrant uh, foliage as well as the fruit. Now, bayberry is dioecious. I, I'm talking about hollies, and I did mention that it's the classic plant that the male and female flowers are actually on separate plants. So you do need to have a male plant as well as a female plant. But if your neighbor has a female holly that's well uh, pollinated and fruited every year, there's a male somewhere around. And so you don't necessarily have to plant a male uh, since the, uh, to get pollination the plant can be thousands of feet away. Now, bayberry is also dioecious, so you need to have a male and a female plant. Obviously, the females will have the waxy uh, berries that you can make bayberry candles out of. Um, and they're not sexed uh, in the nursery industry. So I always look for remnant fruit when I'm buying bayberries. Look for a persistent fruit. You know you have a female plant. You might only need one male for 50 uh, bayberries. And of course, bayberry is salt tolerant, drought tolerant, uh, can get to be quite a tall shrub, uh, eight, 10 feet tall, but you can prune it and cut it back to the ground as well. I photographed this a number of years ago. Uh, this is the uh, median strip on Route 138 in Jamestown. And I'm disappointed that in the last several years, the Department of Public Works or someone has eliminated that planting of bayberries that was perfectly happy uh, drawing drought tolerant, salt tolerant right along the median on 138. And of course, you notice the, the rest of the native plants in the background are native red cedars, Junipers virginiana. Of course, the waxy fruit and the blue fruit of, of uh, red cedar, Junipers virginiana. 
So we're going to look at remaking this uh, garden. So uh, it's an entry garden. So entry gardens are an important place to consider the winter landscape since you're always walking through it or looking out the kitchen window uh, year round. We, want, we can have gardens that are beautiful in summer as well as in winter. So we're changing this space and we're going to make an ellipse. Uh, and this is a drought tolerant landscape with no irrigation system. This is August. You can see Russian sage that's blooming and the orange flowers on Asclepius tuberosa, butterfly weed and cranby. Whoops. So here's making the garden. We eliminated that step. I don't know why that standard hydrangea was in the corner. We moved it, transplanted it, uh, and uh, added other plants that are tough and drought tolerant. So this is Amsonia, blue star. Amsonia tabinae montana is the herbaceous perennial that forms this uh, base layer. And here we have the scalloped leaves of sea kale, cranby meridima, with these fluted blue leaves, fragrant flowers, orange flowers on Asclepius and sedums, and all tough drought tolerant plants. And in the winter landscape, if it's a nice warm day, you might want to go out and sit in this entry garden as well. The pine is a golden form of Pinus virginiana. This is weights gold. And the, it has um, lime green foliage. And then with cold weather, it uh, brightens to uh, yellow, almost chrome yellow in the landscape. And here it's combined with yellow flowers on Mahonia as well as the yellow flowers of witch hazel, hemimelis, mollus, wisley supreme, or sweet sunshine, and the yellow fruit of uh, Princeton gold uh, American holly. So there's the kitchen window that you're always designing for looking out, and you see witch hazels blooming in January and February. Potentilla tridentator, the name's been changed to Sebaldioptis. It's a tough herbaceous ground cover, grows on top of Cadillac Mountain uh, in the cracks of rock ledges, grows on top of Mount Washington at 4,000 feet, tough and drought tolerant, and it stops when it hits an edge. So it's not gonna overgrow the curve of that ellipse. And it's a tough plant that you can walk across as well. So grove of trees are striking in the landscape. And this is a grove of Dawn Redwoods, Metasequoia glyptostervoides, at PepsiCo Sculpture Garden in Purchase, New York. It was uh, the corporate headquarters of uh, PepsiCo. It was designed by the uh, famous English landscape designer, Russell Page. In years past, PepsiCo was open year round. They renovated the gardens that last several years. So you need to check. They, I think, are only open on weekends, uh, but a beautiful uh, property with uh, gardens and amazing sculpture. Henry Moore, you can imagine Calder and, and many other uh, plants in the landscape. Uh, but these trees can also fit into a much smaller landscape. So this is a tiny a poach to stamp a garden in Providence. And um, neighbor's house has been cleaned up, looks like a crack house in this photograph. But uh, um, it, it, it's uh, been renovated and the Fence line, however, is, is the dominant line form here. And uh, Barbara had a Norway maple tree that died several years ago, it was giving valuable shade in this garden space. So she needed another tree to plant to give some shade. And we wanted something fast growing. Uh, and so a deciduous conifer like Dawn Redwood. And so that's what we planted to change this landscape. So we moved in the largest Dawn Redwood that we could fit through that gate. Um, so that's um, some 16 feet tall. Of course, Dawn Redwoods can grow three feet or more a year. Uh, so it's, uh, here it is in the garden. We also planted a grove of skinny conifers, um, white spruces, Picea glauca pendula, which are basically narrow forms in the landscape. So here's the Dawn Redwood giving a uh, valuable shade to the garden. And all these tree forms make the space seem even larger. And of course, Barbara had already planted a coral bark maple uh, next to the house. Here's the Dawn Redwood in the winter and fall. And Acer pomatum sangu kaku with its red colored stems that you see right outside of the window. In fall and winter. 
before and after. So adding trees, even to small gardens is valuable all seasons of the year, but especially in winter because it gives structure. Now there are winter flowers, we've started talking about witch hazels, but hellebores and Christmas rose, Helleborus niger, uh, can bloom in December and January. Evergreen foliage, it's a member of the buttercup family. Helleborus fetidus has these interesting uh, finger-like evergreen leaves and greenish flowers. Here are uh, hellebores and mahonia. I'm going to talk about some of the plants I have here in uh, vases at the end of this talk, and we'll talk about mahonia, uh, which is blooming now. So uh, yellow flowers that can start blooming in December uh, and January, and the flowers will hold through the winter time. It has uh, spiny evergreen leaves that look like holly. This is a leather leaf mahonia, mahonia bilii. It's a shrub that can get to be five or six feet tall or kept pruned about four feet. It'll grow in dry shade. And again, it's uh, valuable for pollinators that venture out on warm winter days. So Hamamelis vernalis, is our other native witch hazel besides the fall blooming Hamamelis virginiana. Hamamelis vernalis is native to the Ozarks. Um, it's perfectly hardy in New England and starts blooming in January and February with small flowers. There's a cultivar called amethyst, which has a, instead of yellow flowers, these alluring uh, lavender amethyst colored flowers and red fall foliage color as well. Perhaps one of my favorite, of several favorites, obviously, uh, which hazels, Jelena. Now this is an um, interspecific hybrid of Asian witch hazel, a cross between Chinese and Japanese witch hazel, Hamamelis ex intermedia. And Jelena has orange flowers. And again, we have winter bees. Uh, Arnold's Promise was introduced by the Arnold Arboretum in Boston. And again, these Asian witch hazels, depending on the weather can start blooming in January, uh, February through March. It really depends on what's happening with uh, temperatures. They, they can grow in full sun or partial shade and are large shrubs that will get to be uh, 10 feet or more tall. You could probably keep a witch hazel pruned about eight feet, but not much shorter than that. They can actually get to be uh, 12 or 15 feet tall. This is at Tower Hill Botanic Garden, uh, Diane with red flowers. Jelena, again, Arnold's Promise. This is Shibamichi Red, which is a very different color. And witch hazels are perfectly root hardy to be grown in containers and exposing their roots to cold winter air temperatures. Now, many hardy plants are not hardy to have their roots exposed in a pot. For instance, hollies are not the perfectly hardy in the ground. Uh, other conifers like pines are. And witch hazels are also perfectly hardy to grow in containers. So you can grow witch hazel where you don't have soil by uh, growing it in a, in a pot. And for years, we grew Jelena in a 24 inch stoneware container, stoneware potteries, uh, frost proof if, if it's filled with soil, it's high fired uh, pottery. So here's Jelena with fall foliage color. And this year, Jelena was blooming in January. You can see the Christmas lights are still up. Uh, so you can grow witch hazels in pots. This is the Poly Hill uh, Arboretum again on Martha's Vineyard with witch hazels in bloom. And here's a landscape that we're making and we're adding witch hazels outside of these windows. So this is Jolena and these are grown as a top grafted standard. So we, they're grafted on parotia. And so instead of branching low to the ground, we have almost like a tree form and there can be planted close to the house. And we have this beautiful view looking out in the winter landscape with Jelena with its warm orange flowers blooming on a cold day. Mahonia, Mahonia bilii and my, one of my favorite combinations is combining it with um, the Asian spice bush, Lindera angustifolia, which has marcescent foliage like our native beech leaves. They uh, turn this wonderful coppery tan and hold their leaves all winter long. So a great combination of contrast between evergreen and form and flowers. So Lindera angustifolia is drought taunt. Now our native spice bush Lindera umbellata is, uh, grows in wetlands and it's one of those heralders of spring when you see those little yellow flowers blooming 
before Forsythia. Um, but Lindera um, um, umbellata needs to grow in moisture retentive soil. The Asian spice bush, Angustifolia, is drought tolerant and will grow in partial shade as well as in sun. It turns, the foliage turns pumpkin orange in uh, November and then holds its tan leaves all winter long, a great contrast uh, in front of evergreen leaves like holly. So here's uh, the summer foliage, jet black fruit and winter leaves that are persistent and they hold on until May when its yellow flowers start to emerge. So it's not an evergreen plant, but it's a ever in leaf plant because it's actually in leaf probably 11 months of the year. It doesn't take long before the new leaves will start to emerge. Uh, so it's a, a beautiful plant to add to the garden. Another uh, favorite uh, native small tree is our native Magnolia virginiana. This is sweet bay magnolia, and there's an evergreen form. So Magnolia virginiana has a native range from the north coast, north uh, of Massachusetts up on Cape Ann, in the town of Magnolia, which is part of Manchester by the sea, south all the way down the east coast of Florida. But of course, plants growing in Florida aren't necessarily hardy in Rhode Island and Massachusetts. But this is hardy. It's uh, Magnolia virginiana variety australis. And this is at Tranquil Lake Nursery, holds its leaves all winter long. I've also found that magnolias are much more drought tolerant than you might read about. Uh, their waxy cuticles of their leaves are indication that they've evolved to withstand drier conditions. This is at the Arnold Arboretum um, in the wintertime. This is a cultivar called Milton that Peter Del Tredici uh, selected in Milton, Massachusetts. Henry Hicks is another form. So this is a tranquil lake nursery. There's November, there's December, there's March. So having a small tree that grows to be about 25 feet tall, with these uh, evergreen leaves with these silvery white undersides is invaluable in the winter landscape. And here we've used them in an entry garden in the very narrow space between the garage and the house this is the kitchen window, and the kitchen window looked out on the inclined plane of the garage roof, which wasn't very attractive. So by planting a small tree uh, with evergreen foliage, you're looking out on evergreen leaves from the kitchen window. And of course, you recognize the marcescent leaves of and, uh, Lindera angustifolia, evergreen ferns, underplant them, the red berries of winterberry holly, all in this very small space. So there are different named cultivars of Magnolia virginiana that are evergreen. There's Green Shadow, there's Henry Hicks, um, Moonglow, Jim Wells is another one, and evergreen wood ferns uh, at their base. Umbrella pine is a, a unique pine, uh, a new, unique evergreen with its waxy needles that are arranged in a whirl like the spokes on, a, on an umbrella, Cyadopitus virginiana. Uh, wintergreen is a selection uh, made by uh, University of Connecticut, Sid, Professor Sid Waxman many years ago, which has excellent colored foliage in the winter landscape. So this is a before photograph. This happens to be a, this is in Manchester by the sea up on the North shore of Massachusetts. Uh, an overgrown landscape with umbrella pines too close to the house. And of course, the, the rhododendrons are overgrowing and we're gonna transplant and, and move all of this. Uh, so this was originally a much larger mansion that saw unfortunate architectural times in the 1970s with casement windows being added. And of course, there was originally a much bigger wing of a house that was here and this ugly shed roof was there. So we're gonna renovate this and change it. So we're gonna transplant these umbrella pines because they're so valuable. We hand dug them and we're moving them and we're making a new entry. And we plant it with tough drought tolerant plants, Amsonia tabernae montana's blue star. So there's no irrigation system here, Japanese maples and here are the umbrella pines. So the house has changed. And this is the entry to the kitchen door, which is a primary importance. And you notice, uh, recognize that we have witch hazels and Japanese maples. So here we are being greeted to the kitchen door with Japanese maples with their uh, interesting armature, witch hazels blooming and mahonia blooming in the wintertime. 
And when you open the door, you look out at Witch Hazel Jelena uh, greeting you in the landscape as well. So we've talked about bees and how important having winter blooms are with all these different plants that bloom from hellebores to uh, sarcococcus, sweet shrub and mahonias and uh, have provide nectar and sustenance in the wintertime. And there are other evergreen perennials as well. And yucca is one of my favorites. I think a very misunderstood plant uh, because it will survive anywhere. It will survive abandonment. It will survive uh, neglect. So it's seen in the coarsest and perhaps meanest landscapes because it survives. But it's this beautiful whirl of evergreen leaves because there's bright edge and gold sword. And so here we have this almost like a hedge of yuccas in the winter landscape and this contrast of blue and yellow with dwarf forms of blue spruces and the yellow leaves of yucca. Now, of course, yucca, like other plants, needs grooming. So what you need to do in the springtime is perhaps remove some of the old basal foliage. I mean, you can actually cut it to the ground and it'll re-sprout as well. Um, so yucca is a tough drought tolerant plant that is valuable in the winter landscape. This is a sunken garden, like Asa Grisium, and we saw that photograph before of the Lindera uh, and the bark on the Asa Grisium. Russian sage. So this is a perennial that you should leave standing all winter long. Russian sage, uh, tough drought tolerant blue flowers, grows in open sky, full sun, and it has stems that are covered with this beautiful white downy uh, substance. Um, so leave it standing all winter, uh, and it should be cut down to perhaps eight inches or six to eight inches in the springtime uh, to force new growth and, and proliferous new flowers on Russian sage, Porofskia, the triplicifolia. Now, of course, running water doesn't freeze, and this is actually a bird bath we had in our house in Seekonk for years. We kept the pump running so that uh, we would have water for, for the birds. And of course, if you really have some volumes of water, uh, it won't freeze in, in the winter time. So this is an example of an entry garden where we've used water uh, for its sound to actually mask the noise of that high pitched noise of vehicle traffic. This is in Western Massachusetts and it's not close to the Mass Pike, but you can hear the Mass Pike uh, from a mile away. Uh, and so we made this new garden. This is a before photograph. And it's a small space, it's about 36 feet by 36 feet. Uh, and if you had the windows open or coming here, you would hear that disconcerting sound of, of tire noise. So we made this, um, and that didn't do it. So we uh, created a 16 foot stainless steel water table uh, to create a waterfall, since you have to have a height of falling water to, to create enough sound and created this a veil of sound that envelops you when you come into the space. So this is stainless steel and plate glass, which is highly reflective. We only have a couple inches of water that's in the top of uh, this sculptural pool. And uh, we've reset the stones into a, using larger stones in a zigzag pattern, planted low bush blueberries and cranberries at the edge of the pool. Here's cranberries, vaccinium macrocarpum, low bush blueberries, vaccinium angustifolia, Japanese maples. And we planted a grove of evergreens, skinny conifers, Pinus uh, nutcatensis of Vander Acker, which is a form of Alaskan uh, cedar, uh, Japanese maples with their armature. This is a dwarf mountain laurel uh, minuet that's blooming in uh, June. And here it is uh, in fall and winter. And witch hazels, of course, are a feature. And this is uh, Hemimelis japonica shibamichi red, which has uh, alluring red flowers uh, blooming in February. And the water runs all year long. Haven't, haven't had snow like that for a couple of years. We also planted a few thousand minor bulbs uh, to celebrate spring after winter leaves. And so we have Pushkinir and, and uh, Muscari uh, and Cheyenne Doxa, uh, all these minor bulbs that come up as a ground cover as well. And of course, hardy bulbs 
like a winter aconite can survive snow and ice and, and uh, hold their heads through the snow as do snowdrops. So think about your winter garden in September when you should have been planting all of these bulbs and think about all the other aspects. So the fuzzy buds of magnolias, and I, I'm going to show you some plants that I brought as well, which almost look like pussy willows. There are these uh, silver hairs which uh, become incandescent with the low angle of the winter sun, magnolia stellata. The buds on Andromeda, pyrus. So not winter flowers, but winter buds are highly colored. This is Brower's beauty. And the flower buds, of course, will open white in uh, late April and May, but they're coppery red in the wintertime. This is an evergreen magnolia grandiflora. Here are the buds on Brower's beauty. Of course, it's a shrub that can easily get to be um, five to six feet tall. It's not a tiny little plant. There are more dwarf andromedas as well. And if you really need color, get out your paintbrush and add some color to the winter landscape, uh, perhaps with yellow, uh, vibrant yellow. These are bamboo poles that we cut from Blythewold uh, in Bristol, Rhode Island years ago, and we painted them to make these uh, sunbeams come down the garden. Here it's complemented with that chrome yellow of Pinus virginiana, weights gold. Purple. Matching the color black too, but this is my my, my favorite uh, paint is a C2 paint. I'll give Adler's hundred year old store Adler's hardware. You all know them in Wickham and Street in Providence, Rhode Island, and and uh, go get their C2 color and ask for black tulip and add that to your garden for winter landscape. Nice to have clients when you say, "I'm let's paint the fence purple." They say, "Yes." It's a shadow color. So. Open your eyes, and perhaps we don't have snow on the ground, but uh, appreciate all the ephemeral beauty that there is in winter, the shadows, uh, the ice crystals, the hoarfrost, and uh, celebrate the winter garden, and it will be spring again. Thank you.